Welcome to Mr. B. Bob. Agatha Christie killed hundreds of characters in her books. Some by drowning, some by stabbing, and one with a crowbar. But her preferred murder weapon was chemical, rather than physical. She wrote 85 books, 66 of them detective novels, of which 41 included poisons. More than 80 victims are poisoned in the entirety of Christie's works. Let's find out more about some of the poisons used by the Queen of Crime novels. Poison has a certain appeal, wrote Agatha Christie and they do it with mirrors. It is not the crudeness of the revolver bullet or the blunt instrument. Christie was said to have freely admitted to knowing nothing about ballistics, but used poisons with a high degree of accuracy. Her knowledge was extensive as a result of her work as a war nurse and a volunteer in the local hospital dispensary during the First World War. In 1917, she trained and passed the examinations required to qualify as an apothecary's assistant. During this time in the hospital's dispensary, she was responsible for concocting a number of remedies. This required her to understand the substances themselves as well as their dosages and dispensing techniques. She continued working among drugs and dispensaries for many decades. She used poison to kill her characters more often than any other crime fiction writer. And these are not fictional poisons, on the contrary, her toxins are well known to science and often placed as a central part of her novels. Her choice of deadly substances was far from random, the chemical and physiological characteristics of each poison provide vital clues to the discovery of the murderer. Strychnine is used in Christie's first whodunit, The Mysterious Affair at Styles, in which she introduced the world to Detective Hercule Poirot. In the Stiles household, there is plenty of strychnine available to any would-be poisoner. There are packets and bottles of strychnine in the form of pesticides and tonics. And, if that wasn't enough, one member of the household works in a hospital dispensary with access to stores of medicinal strychnine. The mystery is, which source did the murderer make use of, and how was the drug administered to Mrs. Inglethorpe? Strychnine is also used in four other Christie novels and five short stories. Cyanide features in 10 novels and four short stories. She kills off 18 characters with the poison administered in injections, drinks, smelling salts, and cigarettes. In the mirror cracked from side to side, cyanide was added to a nasal spray used for allergies to kill Ella Zielinski. Marston finishes his drink and promptly dies of cyanide poisoning in and then there were none. Dr. Armstrong confirms that there was no cyanide in the other drinks and suggests that Marston must have dosed himself. Adele, the wife of London businessman Rex Fortescue, dies from cyanide in her tea in a pocket full of rye. And of course, in sparkling cyanide, Mr. and Mrs. Barton die of potassium cyanide poisoning. The killer administers cyanide, whose real use in the house is to kill wasps, to their glass of champagne. The most common poison used is arsenic, probably because it was such an easy chemical for people to acquire at the time. It could be bought as rat poison or in fly paper, just like the strychnine her murderers were also able to buy at their local shops. A tasteless, odorless white powder, arsenic is minimally soluble in cold water but readily dissolves in hot fluids such as tea or cocoa. Christie used it to kill eight characters in four novels and four short stories. In 450, from Paddington, Alfred Crackenthorpe is found dead at his residence, and later, the curry made by Lucy Islesborough on the fateful day is found to contain arsenic. Arsenic is also used to kill one of the victims in Murder is Easy. In other books, Christie turned to medication. Good for the victim in moderation, but deadly when overdosed. 
Digitalis is an extract of the foxglove plant. The active chemical is digitoxin, readily absorbed into the gastrointestinal tract and acting quickly upon the heart. The monstrous matriarch Mrs. Boynton is killed, in appointment with death, by a large dose of digitoxin, the same substance as she was taking in her heart medication, making the foul play difficult to prove. Foxglove is also featured in The Postern of Fate. Investigating the past of the Parkinson household, Tuppence finds out that Mary Jordan was employed as a governess for the Parkinsons. Mary reportedly died accidentally, poisoned by eating lethal foxglove leaves. The leaves had been mixed into a salad that she ate. The death occurred 60 years before the present. The chemical compound we know as nicotine is often associated with smoking-related deaths, but it is actually very toxic on its own. It's absorbed easily through the skin and can kill from dermis contact alone, making it an occupational hazard for tobacco field workers. It's fast-acting too. When inhaled, nicotine enters the brain within seconds. The only Christie novel to use nicotine as a murder weapon was Three-Act Tragedy. It has three victims, one of them a vicar, and all die of ingesting pure lethal nicotine mixed in their cocktail. Cocaine features as a method of murder in one of the short stories included in Poirot's early cases. Justice Christie allowed the use of poison to be disguised by having the victim use the same substance as a medication, here she created a character whose history of drug use enabled them to be killed in a way that the less skilled police detectives attributed to simple accident. In the affair at the Victory Ball, the victim Miss Courtney is known to take cocaine, so when she is killed, it takes Poirot to realize that something more sinister has happened. In The Pale Horse, the murderer uses a coven of witches to curse victims, thus masking deaths due to thallium used in rat poison. Thallium can be absorbed topically, ingested, or inhaled, is colorless and tasteless, dissolves in water, and has a slow onset of vague symptoms. Hair loss is also common, which triggers suspicion in the story. Whichever drug or poison Christie uses in her murder plots, she is careful to plan its administration and describe its effects in an accurate manner. In A Pocket Full of Rye, for example, the taxine that has been extracted from the U hedges around Rex Fortescue's home is added to his breakfast marmalade, where he would be unable to detect its bitter taste. The murderer later puts cyanide in another victim's tea. In Five Little Pigs, the painter Amiya's Crail is murdered with Conian. An alkaloid extracted from hemlock, Conian works peripherally as a neurotoxin, causing death by respiratory paralysis. The poison was disguised in a glass of beer. The negative effects of hemlock are not attributable to a single poison, but to the combined effects of several alkaloids in the plant, which act quickly upon the nervous system. In Cards on the Table, the murderer kills his victim by contaminating his shaving brush with Bacillus anthracis, knowing the bacillus could pass transcutaneously through any nicks made by the razor. Exposure to Bacillus anthracis results to the infectious disease anthrax. White phosphorus can kill an adult by ingestion, and the symptoms can appear similar to natural causes, such as a ruptured ulcer. Emily, the victim in Dumb Witness, suffered from liver disease, a fact the murderer used to great advantage. Emily was in the habit of taking liver capsules after her evening meal, and the murderer added white phosphorus to one of the capsules, assuming any illness and damage to the liver would be attributed to her existing liver condition. 
But the glowing vapor seemed to emerge from her mouth during the seance gave Poirot the clue he needed. Described by the Roman naturalist Plinius as plant arsenic, monkshood was once used to coat spears, prior to hunting panthers and wolves. In 450 from Paddington, Harold Crackenthorpe, after returning home to London, receives a delivery of tablets from Dr. Camper, who had told him not to take more, yet sends him more. Harold takes them. They are poisoned with monkshood, and he dies whilst being watched taking the tablets by Lady Alice, his wife. Agatha Christie's other ingenious methods of murder include dipping a dart in the poison of the boomslang snake to kill Madame Giselle and death in the clouds. Belladonna, also known as deadly nightshade, devil's berries, or death cherries, are well known to cause hallucinations giving victims the sensation of disassociation, and even flying. In A Caribbean Mystery, Molly Kendall is a young wife who starts the hotel where the story takes place. She eventually believes she has fallen mentally ill, although her symptoms are the result of being poisoned from belladonna being added to her cosmetics. Belladonna is also featured in The Big Four, and one of the short stories in the 1947 collection titled The Labors of Hercules. The victim in this story suffers from insanity and hallucinations, which are, not so coincidentally, also the symptoms of belladonna poisoning. The antidote for belladonna poisoning is physostigmine or ezerin, a compound that is an extract from the beans of a West African plant, which is itself a poison. In the Crooked House, for instance, the police are puzzled when the poison ezerin that kills Aristide Leonides, a man with several heirs, is discovered in his eye drops. In Sad Cyprus, morphine is thought to be administered through fish paste on sandwiches. Instead, it is served in a pot of tea, the murderer also drinking from the pot to ally suspicion, then surreptitiously self-administrating an emetic. In death comes as the end, said in ancient Egypt, the poison added to the wine which kills Sobek is never discovered, but assumed to be the juice of the poppy. Murder mysteries would be incomplete without the use of sleeping tablets. In Lord Edgware Dies, Carlotta Adams meets her end due to an overdose of Veronal. The first commercially available barbiturate, Veronal had a slightly bitter taste, and a therapeutic dose far below the toxic dose. However, tolerance occurred with chronic use, requiring higher doses for effect, and fatal overdoses, either accidental or intentional, were not infrequent. Christie also has some fun with her poisons and killer chemical compounds, possibly tired of keeping to the straight and the narrow in most of her books. The poison's calmo, in The Mirror Cracked from Side to Side, and Serenite in A Caribbean Mystery, are Christie inventions. Curtain, in which Poirot makes his final appearance, is a lesson in polypharmacy, or the simultaneous use of multiple drugs. Frida Clay's aunt is poisoned with morphine. Barbara Franklin is poisoned with physostigmine. Poirot drugs Hastings hot chocolate with sleeping tablets, unnamed, but possibly veronal, to prevent him committing murder. Did you know? Christie's attention to detail left her open to the accusation that she offered a handbook for would-be murderers. In her book A is for Arsenic, The Poisons of Agatha Christie, Catherine Harkup recounts a 1977 case in France, 
in which Roland Roussel, a 58-year-old office worker, murdered his aunt using atropine eye drops. The gendarme who found a copy of the Miss Marple mystery, the Tuesday Club murders in Roussel's apartment reportedly declared, I'm not saying Roussel was inspired by the book, but we found it in his apartment with the relevant passages on poison underlined. At the same time, Christie's precision when it came to poisons can apparently be credited with saving at least two lives. Harkup quotes a 1975 letter from a woman in South America who had raised justified suspicion that an acquaintance was being poisoned by his young wife. She wrote to Christie in thanks, concluding, but of this I am quite, quite sure, had I not read The Pale Horse and thus learned of the effects of thallium poisoning, X would not have survived. Two years later, soon after Christie's own death, a nurse with a taste for mysteries spotted the symptoms of thallium poisoning in a 19-month-old in Qatar. In their report, the child's physicians acknowledged their indebtedness to the late Agatha Christie for excellent and perceptive clinical descriptions, and to Nurse Maitland for keeping us up to date with the literature. Thank you for watching. See you again next time.